I received a text a moment ago that uh, Norma Manch was taking Bob to the emergency room because he was uh, vomiting blood. So I'm going to ask if you would to join me in prayer as we pray for Bob Manch. God, we're grateful and thankful for this day and all the things you provide for us. But we lift up to you, our brother Bob, and, and his situation now. We pray for the doctors and the medical staff that are be caring for him. And we pray, Father, that whatever ailment he's facing, that they will prescribe and do the things that are necessary to relieve them of that. Pray also for Norma, Father, as she faces these challenges. Give her comfort and strength. May we be an encouragement to her as she faces the challenges ahead. We pray, Father, in all things that your will be done. We ask, we ask this and offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Do you want to take a moment to welcome the Beam family to our fellowship and to our congregation here? Grateful that they're placing membership. Also want to uh, thank the Thomases, uh, Kelly and, and, um, and all of them that were involved in the, the VBS and uh, we appreciate all the work. I don't know if you saw all the work they did, uh, but they did a lot of work. And Lori uh, spent a lot of time putting things together. I know Connie and, and Kevin were involved in that and all the Thomas kids. And there were others of you involved as well. I just say to you, thank you for that. I know that you, there was some effort that was put into that. And I'm grateful for the effort. And I pray that it was beneficial for those that, uh, partake, that partook in that. Also want to make mention of the Jones family that's here. And... Um, they're not here with their with with the, the husband Solomon Jones, but they've been dear friends of ours for some time. And in fact, I used to babysit Sarah when she was a small child. I know I don't look old enough, but and she doesn't look old enough. But we're grateful here. Solomon's a preacher at a congregation in New Mexico, and we're sorry we're he's not here, but we're grateful that the Joneses are here with us this morning. This morning we're going to talk about whose will do you do? Whose will do you do? In the account of the death of John the Baptist is relayed by Matthew and also in the book of Mark, we're going to be looking at both of those passages, what we find is there's a group of people, there's a group of characters that are mentioned, and ultimately we can ask the question and we're going to evaluate whose will did they do? Whose will did they do? And, and, and before we begin that, I guess I should ask you a question. Maybe you should ask yourself this question. Are there times that you do things that you don't want to do? And I'm sure we could all say yes to that question. In fact, I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to the church in, the, in Rome there, the, the Romans in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 15. Here's what he says at the end of that verse. He says, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. Even the apostle Paul was challenged with the things that he did. And he, is, he later says in verse 19 of that same chapter, for the good that I want, I I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want to do. There's times that we face and do things that we don't want to do. And maybe perhaps as we look at this and evaluate this, we can be asking ourselves the question, as we look at the characters involved in this account, we can be asking ourselves the question, whose will do we really do? Whose will do we do? Now, when you think about not doing the things that, that you want to do, you might ask, well, why is that the case? And many of you uh, have been ten teenagers before and perhaps have had teenagers as well, and you've, you've faced the challenges of peer pressure. I want you to know teens that are in the audience today, that's not a teen problem. That's a human being problem. Because even as adults, we face the challenges of peer pressure doing things that we do, may not want to do because of the pressure of those around us. Maybe you, do, you don't do the things that you, you want to do, or maybe you don't do things because of pride. Pride gets in the way. In fact, one of the characters we'll see today in the account, pride was one of the reasons he did some things he didn't want to do. Pride will often, often be a challenge for us in doing those things. Maybe, maybe you do things you don't want to do because you receive attention from others. May, maybe by doing those things, and again, teens, that's not just a teen problem. We see that in adulthood also, where perhaps we do things to gain attention. So we should ask ourselves the question, do some self-evaluation, not looking at others, but asking ourselves, whose will do you do? Whose will do I do when I'm out and about and when I'm 
carrying on my responsibility as a Christian. As I mentioned, there are four characters that are specifically talked about in this account. And we're going to talk about each of these characters involved in the death of John the Baptist directly. We're going to look at each of these characters and we're going to ask some questions about whose will did they do and hopefully we can make some application to our own life as well. The characters are Herod, Herodias, Herodias' daughter, and John the Baptist. So we'll look at each four of those today and, and this morning and make some evaluation because I believe we can learn something from each of them about whose will we may do. And again, this is for the purposes of us making proper evaluation. Let's talk about the first character, Herodias. Now we know some things about Herodias from scripture. We also know some things about her from history. We have some information about the Herods and the Herod family from history. In fact, we learn about Herod's daughter's name from history. It's not specifically mentioned in scripture. And we'll talk about her as we get to Herod's daughter specifically. But Herod's uh, Herodias was married to her half-uncle Philip. So she's married to her half-uncle Philip. She divorces Philip and she marries Philip's brother. It's known as Herod in scripture here, but in history we know him as Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. You recall Herod the Great was the, the Herod that carried out the killing of all the children when, when Jesus was born. Well, this is his son and Philip is also his son. Philip and, and Herod Antipas are half-brothers. But, but Herodias was married to Philip first, divorced him, and then married Herod Antipas. And John the Baptist has pointed out that Herod is in a relationship with Herodias that is unlawful. And so he says, and he's been saying over and over again, if you look at verse four, uh, chapter four, 14, verse 4, Matthew 14, verse 4, John has been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now some have stated that John was condemning this marriage with Herod and Herodias because it was incestual in nature. She's actually related to, to Herod and therefore that's why John the Baptist was, was making this, uh, this co condemnation of their marriage. But we learn some more in Mark's account and Mark's account says that that John the Baptist was actually saying it's not lawful for you to have, quote, your brother's wife. He's not condemning the marriage because of ancestral reasons. He's condemning the marriage because he's in an unlawful marriage. And notice John the Baptist considers Herodias to be Philip's wife, even though they've been divorced. Because of John's criticism of Herod and Herodias, in this unlawful marriage, she's not happy about it. And so what is the result of that? She sought to kill him. She wanted John the Baptist dead. That was her will. Her will was to get John the Baptist killed. Now, ultimately, she wasn't successful initially because we'll learn as we talk about Herod that Herod protected John the Baptist for some, for some time. But she didn't, even though she didn't immediately get her will, ultimately, she would get an opportunity and she would actually use other people to accomplish her will. She's actually going to get what she wants by using others. She uses Herod and she uses her own daughter to carry out the will that she wants, which is John the Baptist dead. Now, as we evaluate her will, I asked the question at the beginning, sometimes we do the things we don't want to do. But in this case, what Herodias is doing is obviously evil. And it's not something that is acceptable to God. And so that's why we point out, though, even though she's doing her own will, she's doing an evil thing. She's doing that which is not in accordance with God's will. We should recognize that our will can be in contrast to God's will. The things that we do could be in con the things that we want to do can be in contrast to God's will. And so as we look at Herodias and we ask the question, Whose will do you do? Do you carry out your own will, perhaps like Herodias do, did? And perhaps even use others to carry out your own will, even though it's in contrast to God's will? We'll talk more about that in the conclusion as I make some more application to each of the characters. Whose will do you do? 
Now we look at the next character. This is Herodias' daughter. We learn from history that her name is Salome. We don't, it's not mentioned specifically in scripture, but history tells us that, that that's in fact her name. She's the daughter of Herodias and Philip, the, the brother of, uh, of Herod Antipas. And she, as I mentioned, she's identified as, uh, as Salome. And she is actually the half-niece of Herod Antipas. So when you think about this, there, there is a relationship even between Herod's daughter, or excuse me, Herodias' daughter and the king Herod. Now, I, I do want to talk briefly. Well, I'll save it for Herod. I'll, I'll mention it when we talk about Herod. Let's continue with Herod's, or excuse me, Herodias' daughter. So an opportunity comes around, and, and, and Herod's having this great feast, and he's invited all of these people to the feast, and one of the people that are there is Herodias and her daughter. And it's a birthday party. And, and so Herodias' daughter is asked to dance for those that were in attendance for this birthday party. And it says in, in Mark chapter 6 and verse number 19 um, that, that, well, that's not the right one. Did I skip one? All right, here we go. Sorry. It says in uh, chapter uh, 6 and verse 23 that Herod promised her, whatever you ask of me, I will give you even up to half of my kingdom. So she does this dance that's so pleasing to Herod that, that he, that he into, evidently or he um, takes the opportunity to say, whatever you ask of me, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Now, stop and pause for a moment. This is the king. And Herodias' daughter can have up to half of his kingdom. Half of his finances, so to speak. And this young lady wanted to make the best of this situation, and so she does what many young people do. They went to the, she went to her parents, or in this case her mother, for some advice. She doesn't want to be rash in her decision. She's been offered up to half of the kingdom of, of Herod, and so she, she goes and she asks her mom, we learn about this in Mark's account, she asked her mom, what shall I ask for? What shall I do? I can have up to half of the kingdom. What should I ask for? In Matthew's account, it says that, that her being prompted by her mother, so her mother gives her some advice and prompts her to do something specifically. We learn about that in chapter 8 of Matthew 14. And her mother, instead of giving her some wise financial advice, Instead of helping her plan for the future to make sure that she has a secure future ahead of her, the mother decided to use her daughter to carry out what she wanted. So Herodias decided, I'm going to use my daughter to get what I want. She's really not even looking out for her daughter's interests at all. She's only focused on what she wants. And so she convinces her daughter to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Think about that for a moment. Put yourself in Herodias' daughter's situation. You could have up to half of a kingdom. You could be financially set for the rest of your life. You don't have to rely on anybody else. You don't have to be given to somebody as a wife because you need to be financially taken care of. You could, be, you could get up to half of his kingdom just by asking for it. And yet... What she does is to do what her mother wants. She doesn't do what's in her own best interest. In fact, I, even though the Bible doesn't specifically state this, I think we can imply properly, she doesn't do her own will. She does the will of her mother. Doing that which doesn't even benefit her. And so she asks for John's head. Now again, we, we, we sometimes think of this as a teen problem, but it's really not a teen problem. And we could probably all ask this question and give an affirmative answer. Have other people convinced us to do something we did not want to do? Have we allowed someone else to perhaps dictate to us those things that were not even in our best interest? Or things that even contrasted with God's will? Have we allowed others to do that? We see in this account... That's the very thing that Herodias does with her daughter. Things that, that ultimately led to her not getting what was in her own best interests. So we ask the question again, what, 
Have you let others convince you to do their will, even though it may contrast with God's will? I was reminded as I thought about this, the, the Christians who have, who, have, who have had situations where they had children perhaps, or even without children, they're in a situation where their spouse is not a faithful Christian or not a Christian at all. And yet, uh, I, I can recall for myself when, when I was a, a young person, I, I have an older brother and two younger sisters, my father wasn't a Christian. My father didn't go to church, but my mother made sure her kids were there every time the doors were open. And I imagine that had to be difficult for her. I imagine there was pressure on her to stay and, and not do the things that my father wanted, wanted to do and wanted her to do. But ultimately, I'm grateful my father later became a Christian in my late teenage years and ultimately rectified that problem. But, but, but there are some spouses that never have that issue. I commend those of you that, that don't have faithful spouses and yet you're faithful to the Lord. And you come and you're a part of the worship service and even bringing children and grandchildren ultimately to be able to, to share that with them as well. Have you ever faced a challenge perhaps where you had a family member or friend visiting on a Sunday or Wednesday? And you have an option, a choice to make, and they're not faithful Christians, and, and you can, they don't want to go to church with you, and now you have a choice. Whose will will you carry out? Will it be their will, perhaps, and stay and not, not attend worship service on a Sunday or on a Wednesday? Or, or will you do what God's will is? These are some of the challenges we face. These are the challenges that are faced by Herodias' daughter. She made the wrong choice, carrying out her mother's will. What about Herod? Whose will did Herod do? Well, you would think, here's Herod. He's, he's the king. Yes, the, 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 the Jews were under Roman occupation, and, and so he did have to answer to the Roman authorities, but, but we learned from his father that his father did all kinds of evil things and, and carried it out. He had, he had some of his sons killed. He had his wives killed. He had his wife's parents killed. Remember, he was responsible for all the infants that were up to two years old killed around Judea when Jesus was born. They had some power. This king, Herod Antipas, has power. Now, now he doesn't have the same amount of power as his dad has because eventually, or ultimately, when his dad, Herod the Great, died, three of his sons split up the kingdom. And so Herod Antipas got one-third of the kingdom that, that Herod the Great had. But ultimately, he still, by the way, Philip got another third of that, but, but ultimately he still had great power. Certainly he's not going to let somebody manipulate him into doing someone else's will or manipulate him into doing something he doesn't want to do. Matthew's account tells us that Herod wanted to put John the Baptist to death, but he didn't because of fear of the people. We learn that in verse number 5. We also learn in Mark's account of this that Herod was actually protecting John. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 20, it says that he was afraid of him, knowing that as a righteous and holy man, he was keeping him safe. When he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. So even after he had wanted to put John the Baptist to death, he's protecting John the Baptist, and he even enjoyed the relationship or the conversations that he, were ha he was having with John the Baptist. If we were to evaluate Herod's will based on Matthew's account and Mark's account, what we'd find is he doesn't want John the Baptist dead. He wants to protect him. He's scared of him. So he doesn't want him killed. But although he wanted to keep John alive, his wife Herodias wanted John dead. And so... He was used by his wife to carry out her will. And it says this in Matthew chapter 14, if you go to verse number 9. This is after the dancing and after the, the daughter had asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Remember, he made this rash promise, you know, I'll give you up to half my kingdom, whatever you want. So she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And, and, and so after that, it says in chapter 14 of Matthew, verse number 9, that he was grieved. 
He was grieved by the fact that she had asked for such. But if we continue, notice what that verse says. The king commanded it to be given because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. Pride got in the way. First of all, he, re he made a rash oath, and so he, he felt like he had to carry that out. out. But ultimately, as the king and all these people that are present, he felt some pride and ultimately put John the Baptist to death, even though he didn't want to put John the Baptist to death. Here is the king doing someone else's will above his own will. Now, it's a reminder that even in a leadership role, even in a leadership role, a king or somebody powerful can do someone else's will. Sadly, in some, some of our congregations, elders have fallen prey to this, doing the wills of the, of the congregation or perhaps certain members because they feel the pressure that's sometimes put upon them. I, I commend our elders. I hope you, you will commend them as well and pray for them often because they face some challenges that you're not aware of. And, and they face some very difficult decisions, and sometimes people bring some very, they bring a lot of pressure on them to do a certain thing in a certain way. I commend our elders for doing what I believe is the right thing to do, even in the face of some of the challenges. But we do have to be reminded that even as leaders, we can be, we can, pride and other things can put us in a situation where we're not accomplishing what God would want us to accomplish, and we're actually doing someone else's will. The final character in our account is John himself. John's in prison because he told Herod that he can't have Herodias as his wife. He's not in prison for some criminal act. He's not in prison because he was out there doing these baptisms. We learn about the baptisms that he was performing. He's not in prison because he's out there preaching and somebody told him to stop. He's in prison because he's condemned the marriage between Herod and Herodias. And the word it used indicates that he continually told Herod that he was not to, that, that he shouldn't have Herodias as his wife, that the marriage was unlawful. So again, this is a constant thing. John's reminding Herod over and over again that he's in an unlawful relationship. Now, I noted and shared with you early in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 20, that, that he recognized John as a just and holy man, as we read that a moment ago. But think about John's position for a moment. John could have avoided being in jail. John could have avoided staying in jail. You know what he had to, all he had to do? Stop condemning that marriage. Tell Herod that he could continue to live in that relationship with Herodias. That's all he had to do. He probably could have secured his release by remaining silent about this marriage or, or just by justifying Herod and Herodias' action. But he's not carrying out his own will. He's not doing things in his own. By the way, John didn't just come up and decide, you know what, I'll just tell Herod and Herodias they're in an unlawful marriage. You know why he said that? Because that was God's will. God was saying that Herod and Herodias were in unlawful marriage. But instead of seeking his own release, instead of preventing his own death by just remaining silent about their marriage relationship or by, by recanting and saying that it's okay for them to be in that relationship, he stood fast and he, hold, he held firm to God's will. And it cost him his life. Think of all the challenges you might face as a Christian. In this country, as we live today, it's probably not going to cost you your life. It might in another country. You go to China or some Middle Eastern country, it might cost you your life. But do we stand firm like John did on God's word? Or do we recant, even in the face of challenges that are much less than death, like ridicule or peer pressure, do we stand firm in those situations? 
when you look and evaluate each of these characters, three of them did the will of someone else. One of them did their own will, which was evil, Herodias. But even John the Baptist wasn't doing his own will. He didn't do the will of some other person. He carried out the will of God, even to his own demise, even to the cost of his own life. So when we can consider in conclusion each of these characters in the account, we can make some application in our own lives. As we go through this application of each of these, I want us to remember this. Committed truth should come before others, family, and even self. Committed truth should come before others, before family, and even before yourself. We noted Herodias did her own will, but her will was in contrast to God's will. She used other people to accomplish what she wanted. And sadly, in this life, people are going to use you and try to use you to accomplish their will. And it may often be in contrast to what God's will is. We can't let our personal relationships with others determine truth. Let me say that again. We cannot let our personal relationships with others determine truth. Truth does not change because an, a family member is engaged in an unlawful marriage. Truth doesn't change. Truth doesn't change when a friend or loved one decides to worship God in an unauthorized way. Truth doesn't change when our family members or friends decide that fornication in whatever form is acceptable. Truth doesn't change, and we need not compromise truth because a loved one is involved. Committed truth should come before others. Herodias' daughter let her mother use her, and her mother did not have her best interests at heart. But she eventually, she evidently was blinded, that is, Herodias' daughter was evidently blinded by her love for her mother, and so she carried out something that was not even in her own best interest. I've often run across people who think family members can do no wrong. I think that's the situation with Herodias' and Herodias's daughter. She, she thought her mother would give her sound advice. She didn't expect her mother would lead her astray and do something that was not in her best interest, but that's exactly what occurred. And sadly, sometimes we fall into that trap as well. We sometimes think loved ones can do no wrong. And sometimes we're blinded to what is apparent to others. And that blinding can lead us to not only denying a situation, but actually helping to do something that's against God's will. Truth doesn't change. Committed truth comes before family. Herod made a rash promise to Herod's, Herodias' daughter, and that promise led him to do something not only he didn't want to do, but also was against God's will. Pride kept him from, from, from making the proper choice. Pride can keep us from doing what's proper. There are people all across this world that want to serve God, but pride keeps them from doing it. Pride keeps them from recognizing a, a necessary change in their life. Pride keeps them from rejecting a sin that perhaps is ruling their life. So they end up not doing what they want because of pride. Don't let pride keep you from doing the right thing. This morning, don't let pride keep you from making the necessary changes. You may need to bring your life into harmony with God's will. Committed truth comes before others, family, and even self. Lastly, John's will. John put God's will first. Even though God's will put him in prison, he did God's will. He didn't deny God's will because it would have been easier for him, but, but he did God's will even though it wouldn't be easy. Doing God's will sometimes will not be easy. It'll be challenging. It can put us in situations that make us, that, that make us uncomfortable. It can put us in situations where ultimately people will dislike us, say things negative about us even try to harm us in some way. But it doesn't change God's will. Will you be committed to God's will, even above your own? Committed truth should come before others, should come before your family, even come before yourself. If you're subject this morning to the invitation, if you're ready to accept God's will and you haven't done so yet, ready to become a Christian, we stand ready to help you. 
Maybe you're already a Christian. You've allowed others to dictate their will upon you. Perhaps you've allowed yourself to rule rather than to let God's will rule. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church or you want to make some public confession of sin. Whatever need you have, I encourage you to come now as together we stand and sing.